Jeffries is an incredible professor, and I'm really excited. I'm deeply grateful for him coming down. Would you join me in welcoming David Jeffries? The topic that I wish to address tonight is really a topic that has most of all to do with the history of biblical interpretation. It has to do with the way in which we read the Bible, see the Bible, and understand it. And uh, the topic in particular that I've chosen has to do with one of the most embarrassing portions of the Old Testament. Uh, it is a passage that has troubled people for years. Uh, and what I want you to see in the course of what I'll say in a few minutes here is that in the interpretation history, people have went to, gone to all sorts of extremes to try to find a way uh, to make it seem better than it is. Uh, and uh, then when we come to the artists, we'll see that the artists have had a variety of approaches to it. I'm going to compare Protestant, Catholic, uh, Calvinist, and Lutheran people uh, who are interpreters and painters in all those traditions, and I hope that it'll be intelligible to you. Let me start with the biblical interpreters, if I may. Uh, so the story of David and Bathsheba, it's probably the best known example in Scripture of the, the phenomenon we call voyeurism. Uh, and, and, and its consequences. The focus in exegesis and literary paraphrase has been overwhelmingly on King David, his lust, his abuse of power, his murder of Bathsheba's no, noble husband, Uriah, his later exposure by Nathan the prophet, his abject repentance captured in the magnificent Psalm 51. But while a poem of repentance has been set to music often and brilliantly, the manuscript illustrators, printmakers, and painters have tended to linger over the initial scene in this sequence in 2 Samuel chapter 11, unable to turn the eyes of their imagination perhaps away from the fair Bathsheba herself. It is as though they see the story from the tempted David's point of view rather than that of Nathan the prophet, or the narrator, the chronicler, or later commentators. For these artists, the repentance of David is of much less interest than his sin. The disposition to focus on Bathsheba involves, of course, artistic license, even a deliberate imposition on biblical narrative. Now, the case here is, is far from unusual. Biblical narrative may even be said to invite interpolations because it's terse, it leaves gaps, it leaves things unsaid. But traditionally, any imaginative filling of the gaps is going to be at to some degree at least constrained, forced back to the original text for contextual warrant. In regard to any imaginary character development in literary or artistic treatment, ordinarily there's going to have to be some plausible prompt or kernel of suggestion in the original biblical account. To wit, in our example tonight, a possible question in the mind of the reader arises as to whether Bathsheba was, in her own way, seeking the attention which came to her. On this matter, the text, though cryptic, leaves a whole lot to the imagination. Subsequent aspects of the narrative development being what they are, imagination has not been wanting, even from the first, to gratify a variety of desires for amplification of the story. In early etymologies given for her name, there are certain hints about this. Uh, her, her name is Bath Sheba, and, and that suggests daughter of fullness to rabbinical commentators, or well-endowed daughter. <clears throat> yes, and while later Jewish commentaries softened this somewhat, suggesting that the meaning might be something like a fine quality of figs, uh, that's in the Sanhedrin, it's uh, in fact it's still the case that there's some erotic overtones. In the Chronicles, a later text than 2 Samuel, in which she is remembered chiefly as the mother of, of four of the sons of David, her name is given as Bathshua, more narrowly, daughter of opulence, a suggestion that in the light of history of the kings of Israel, there was need by this point to turn the focus away from her seduction by David to her royal role as mother of Solomon. This shift is more emphatically expressed when she is cited in later Jewish commentary of the Talmudic period. Bathsheba now becomes one of the 22 virtuous women and is even regarded as possibly the wise woman celebrated in the last chapter of Proverbs uh, who, who gets to speak there, you remember, as the mother of Lemuel. Lemuel sometimes glossed as Solomon. This rather impressive Jewish makeover 
fails to carry over into early or medieval Christian commentary. There, from the fathers through the Glossa Ordinaria, Bathsheba is remembered only minimally as the occasion of a great sin by an otherwise largely noble king through whom the Messiah descends. Despite Bathsheba's indispensable role in that descent, there is already a hint of embarrassment, as you may remember, in Matthew's genealogy, where her name disappears and she becomes her that was wife to Uriah. Though the grievousness of David's sin is not entirely elided, the focus has shifted somewhat away from his act of adultery to the murder of Bathsheba's first husband. This lingering embarrassment relates in patristic exegesis to the requirements of typology. The early commentators cannot avoid seeing David as an antitype of Christ. Accordingly, various forms of exculpation of David rather than of Bathsheba differed in strategy but not in purpose from those in Jewish commentary, are employed to either downplay the Bathsheba incident or to allegorize it away. St. Augustine is represented by the first stratagem in his De Doctrina Christiana, in which he excuses David as not lustful, uh, though he fell into adultery. <laughs> Elsewhere, uh, the diminished uh, focus on Bathsheba shifts almost entirely toward her later life. Uh, when her intervention secures Solomon's ascendancy to the throne. Permitting Middle English commentators to minimize the seduction seen in, in paraphrased, versions, paraphrased versions of the Bible, uh, just basically to elide that altogether. More cryptic still are some of the schoolmen. St. Bonaventure, Bonaventure, for example, has a, a running commentary. He just leaves that part out, says nothing. A minimalist approach to Bathsheba's beauty and its consequences may have seemed, I think, to medieval commentators a kind of charity toward the larger biblical narrative. Gregory the Great exemplifies, he might even originate a more demanding allegorical strategy for, for exculpation of the king. In his ingenious account, and I'm going to read from Gregory here, it very often happens that a circumstance is sometimes in the performance of the action a ground for condemnation, but in the writing a prophecy of merit. For who that hears of it does not utterly loathe this, that David, walking upon his solarium, saw and lusted after Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah? But of whom does David, walking upon the terrace, prefigure other than that one of whom it is written, he has set his tabernacle in the sun, Psalm 19? And what else is it to draw Bathsheba to himself, but to join himself by a spiritual meaning, the law of the formal letter to himself, the law once united to a carnal people, now united to the king. Now this kind of razzle-dazzle uh, raises the uh, rabbinical art of saving the appearances to a whole new level. Gregory goes on to etymologize Beersheba, that's his unexplained substitute for her name, as the seventh well. And that alias lets him slide on into still more ingenious allegories about the yielding of the knowledge of the law to spiritual wisdom. Now such moves, however awkward, presage later medieval tradition. Gregory's purloined etymology becomes the sevenfold well that you find in the marginal glosses of medieval Bibles, where it contributes to the iconography of Bathsheba's bathing scene and the resulting temptation of King David allowing for a loose conflation with Jesus' discourse with the Samaritan woman by the well and the superposition of more modest iconography uh, appropriate to the New Testament episode. Also in these commentaries, uh, and I can give you the names of the patristic authors if you're interested or you can look them up in the book, they, they represent Bathsheba as a type of the law, as though she come, somehow symbolizes the law in its fullness. Uh, and her seduction and later marriage to David, they regard as a liberation from the letter of the law and a marriage to its spirit. What is notable here is the strength of Gregory the Great's influence. His typological associations form the basis of subsequent convention and allegory, despite their rough disjunction with the story at the literal level in the Bible itself. Thus, uh, for example, in the versified Bible of Peter Riga, <clears throat> Bathsheba is described as the, and I'm quoting here, the denuded law, divested of its legal encumbrances. And hence that, and I'm quoting again, that candida scriptorum that Christ loves 
Um, Riga's language in this passage manages nonetheless to be oddly suggestive and maybe reflective also of another passage in Augustine in which, to make a moral point, he was unable to evade the literal level of the narrative. Those who are susceptible to the lust of the eye, Augustine had suggested, should be warned by this story not to raise their eyes to strange balconies or strange terraces. For from afar, David saw her with whom he was captivated, woman afar, lust near, carnal pleasure, especially if directed toward unlawful and strange uh, alien objectives, is to be bridled, not let loose. Now what's surprising, and yet a primary interest in our present context, is that this mainstream of traditional Christian exegesis, a kind of moral reading of the story, in which in which Bathsheba figures as an irresistible temptation to carnal appetite, receives a lot less attention in medieval literature than it does in medieval art. Later on, the temptation scene and its moral dimension are accented both in the commentary and book illustration, especially in the period immediately following upon the Reformation. Martin Luther, for example, still regards the incident of David's adultery typologically and at the literal level as a matter of fact thing, something not to pause over much. Though the problem presented by the text for medieval theologians was primarily the challenge of maintaining David as an, an exemplary a model after his adultery with Bathsheba, in Luther's reading, there's no need to make such an effort. Uh, like his disciple Philip Melanchthon, who recommended a second wife to Henry VIII, among others, um, Luther was inclined to be untroubled by polygamy let alone polygamy amongst biblical kings and patriarchs. John Calvin, however, entirely self-consistently, is neither indulgent of David's miscreants nor much interested in Bathsheba's predicament one way or the other. For him, distinctively, the illicit liaison is just one more indication that the sovereign purposes of God in salvation history are not dependent on the virtues or vices of any human protagonist. Calvin's view of David's sexual misadventure is that it offers a warning, and I'm quoting Calvin here, God wished to testify that he gives no weight to human merits. Now this seems rather dry and unsatisfying from a literary point of view. Yet despite Luther's apparent lack of surprise at what he calls David's bold sin, and Calvin's dismissive generalization, Protestant artistic treatment of the story over the next few decades tends increasingly toward a kind of psychological realism where Bathsheba is concerned. As we shall see, <clears throat> this development becomes at least as interesting in its own modest way as the more frankly erotic treatment by Catholic artists, especially in the period right around the Council of Trent. And in the work of Rembrandt, it eventually produces something both novel and compelling. So Bathsheba's beauty, it's a big topic. The biblical narrative is famously terse where physical or physiological description is concerned. Uh, according to the biblical narrative, from his rooftop garden, David rises up from his bed uh, in the hered. That's what the Hebrew says. It's not the translation that you get in some uh, Bibles, some English Bibles. It's not late one afternoon from his couch, but rather from his bed in the evening. <clears throat> suggesting a, a kind of an extremity of indolence or something like unto it on David's part. David looks down into the courtyard of a nearby house and he sees a woman washing herself and the woman was very beautiful. Now the English translation usually given euphemizes the Hebrew, which is much more explicit. She's described as she was tovoth mra mad. And this literally translates as of an extremely good shape. <laughs> This, uh, the Hebrew is often more frank than English sensibilities are comfortable with. <clears throat> this follows naturally the rather earthly uh, confirmations of female beauty suggested by her name, but it also highlights, pro highlights the problem. Though obviously sexually appealing, her roof tops the house of another man. From the biblical narrative, we do not know to what degree she was unclothed while bathing, but if we are to assume, uh, to assume that her bathing was ritual purification following menstruation, then perhaps her drapery was minimal to non-existent. In early medieval illustration, this probability is distinctly muted, as we'll see in the very first one of our images here. This is from a, a, a vernacular French translation 
of the biblical, biblical passage. And you can see that Bathsheba is shown being watched by David, but all she's really doing is combing out her long red hair. <laughs> Manuscripts of the 13th century uh, Bible Moralisé can be a little more explicit, not much, but books of ours by the late 15th and early 16th century are sometimes a bit more risque, even though it's not the narrative in uh, 2 Samuel, but Psalm 51 that they're illustrating. Now get this, this is an illustration for Psalm 51. Uh, this manuscript is found in the Hog, and you can see that Bathsheba is standing uh, quite erect in the fountain, uh, and she's partially exposed to the gaze of the king, but really she's mostly exposed to the gaze of the viewer, uh, the one who reads this book. This follows another one of the same sort in the same part of the world by a, a painter named Hans Memling. Uh, and what he does is to create a, an image here, which in fact is explicitly directed at the viewer. David can't see what you see. Early Lutheran book illustration follows this approach to varying degrees, but generally with more modesty, as notably in an illustration for Martin Luther's printed commentary on the penitential Psalms of 1525. So then this is in the Psalms, you get to Psalm 51, this is what you see in Luther's commentary. Uh, there, there is, however, a tendency for people, Lutherans, uh, and, and others, but especially Lutherans, during the early generation, the first generation of reformers, to soften things a bit much. So you may know about Lucas Cranach, and this particular representation, also from the Psalms, is the next stage, where you have Bathsheba seen here um, with her ladies-in-waiting, of whom we don't have any record in the Bible, and one of whom is <clears throat> making, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to wash her extended foot. Now, learned knowledge of the Hebrew euphemism, feet for genitalia, that's regal in Hebrew, is doubtless behind the iconography. So a, a post-menstrual ritual purification would seem quite possibly to be intended. But this then is not a literal rendition, right? This is one which suggests what happened, but in, discreet, but, but in a discreet fashion. The, the, the iconographic turn to modesty amongst uh, Lutherans appears also in illustrations for the Swiss German dialect translation, Die ganze Bibel, uh, sometimes called the Zurich Bible. Oops, excuse me, that's Kranich's painting from which uh, this illustration came. And there's Die ganze Bibel. Um, it's found also in various uh, catechisms of this period, including the Helding Catholic Catechism, um, right there. And notice that the modesty is what's characterizing the representation. So what she's getting is a foot wash here. Uh, after mid-century, however, Protestant illustrators seem happy enough to revert uh, really to more frankly erotic uh, representations, uh, including full female nudity in the late medieval style. One sees this especially in editions of Luther's translation of the Bible but also in a work attributed variously to Philip Melanchthon and Johannes Coglerus. It's essentially a catechism. It's entitled the Imagines Elegantissimae. And in this work, the Bathsheba scene illustrates the sixth commandment against adultery. So thou shalt not commit adultery. And so what do you see? You see Bathsheba in her bath. In the same period, catechism for children may display Bathsheba more discreetly, sometimes, uh, mostly clothed with little more than legs bare to mid-thigh. In all of them, David is leering over the balcony, you'll notice, strumming his harp. Uh, or even more modestly in the illustrated Luther Bible designed for family use, um, holding his harp away from himself. In, in the later Calvinist catechetical literature, one can observe a more generalized concern regarding the perils of all such visual indulgence. For Calvin himself, it, you got to eschew this sort of thing in biblical illustration and catechesis alike. He did not approve of Luther's books. Uh, he, in fact, regarded them as essentially Romanish, as he, uses, as he says it, um, Catholic. It's a distraction from the, the business at hand. And here's, I'm quoting Calvin, for what are the pictures or statues to which they append the names of saints, but exhibitions of the most shameless luxury, lechery, obscenity, Indeed, brothels exhibit their inmates more chastely and modestly dressed than churches do images intended to represent virgins. We, we might expect 
that sort of view from Calvin and recognize his scruple in presaging the image-free whitewashed churches of Protestant Amsterdam, such as in their clean, well-lighted, austere beauty, fascinated the painter uh, saint Redam. But a viewpoint very like it appears at the turn of the century with no less stern an admonition and pedagogical ingenuity in a work by a Jesuit, Jan David, a Christlichen Wehrsager. There is, I, I seem to, there, there's the one I want right there. Now, uh, you see, this is a kind of a strange looking thing. If you look in the back uh, of the, behind the head, you'll see the scene that you're familiar with. David's looking down uh, at Bathsheba, uh, and uh, who's bathing. He's looking down from his balcony. He's always on a balcony. But the head is actually uh, designed there to teach things about what you do with your eyes. It's a kind of a medieval version of be careful little eyes what you see. Uh, and it's illustrating a passage in Augustine's sermons, uh, exegesis of Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 28. Uh, and if you remember that, you remember that, you know, it, it's the same thing to look on a woman to lust after her in your heart as to have committed adultery on Jesus' view. So it's illustrating that. Now, these kinds of warnings were coming then from different quarters, Calvin on the one side, Jesuits on the other, but they weren't much heeded by the illustrators and the painters on either side of the Reformation divide. People who were Jan David's uh, contemporaries, many of whom seemed to be attracted to Bathsheba almost as much as was King David. Moreover, uh, there is in some of their work evident adumbration of the Bathsheba narrative with classical stories of temptation and seduction. There's an evident recollection of the myth of Venus and Adonis, for example, already in the David and Bathsheba of Jan Massis. Massis, uh, who's the son of Quentin Massis, uh, a very, uh, how shall I put it, he was a very colorful fellow, uh, and he had returned from a sojourn in Italy, much affected by the depictions he saw there of classical subjects, particularly from Ovid. Uh, in this lush oil painting, executed just as the Council of Trent was drawing to a close, sexual iconography absolutely predominates. <clears throat> the emissary the courtier for David greets a nearly nude Bathsheba, bowing as he does so with an extended leg, which is iconographic, you can figure this one out, simultaneously pointing aloft to his waiting master, uh, almost as if in parody of some representations of the Annunciation. The courtier is accompanied by a hunting hound of the sort you might associate with Adonis. It evidently starts up Bathsheba's sp spaniel, which for its own part uh, responds rather more playfully than any convincing show of resistance. Um, in this painting, Bathsheba's response is coquettish bemusement, while that of attendance is a kind of sympathetic titillation. After this period, the lady spaniel, by the way, will be increasingly present in the iconography wherever David's immodest proposal is being represented. But whereas in a medieval version of this sort of thing, for example, a heroine of Amour Courtois or, 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 or a noble lady whose brass rubbing may show her with her feet on a dog, the image there is of fidelity. The dog uh, stands for her faithfulness. Uh, hence we get Fido, right? Fido for a name of a dog from Fidelitas. Um, and, and that's the sort of thing that you see parodied increasingly in this period. Uh, some of you who know the work of Titian will know that his Venus of Urbino, uh, in fact, has the dog there, but sleeping, paying, not a, paying no attention, sort of suggesting that the guardian of fidelity is off duty. <clears throat> in numerous other examples of counter-reformation depictions of Bathsheba in her bath, the dog is dispensed with altogether in the interest of undistracted visual bacchanalia more like an Orientalist imagination of a harem bath than anything that one could connect with the biblical story. I, I, I'm gonna give uh, you a few of these to look at here just in rapid succession. That's my, my point is not to in, invite you to be voyeuristic, but I want you to recognize that these are all by Catholic painters after the Council of Trent had condemned all such paintings. Okay. <laughs> So you can see that these things are not exactly, these are the kind of things that Calvin was worried about hanging in churches, which is where they all were. Um, if, if you don't have a title, how do you know what that painting is about, right? You wouldn't think it was uh, necessarily uh, about Bathsheba, 
Uh, and there's Artemisia Gentileschi, a woman painter, and she got painted, obviously, these sorts of things on commission as well. So, um, despite the warnings that are there, coming both from conservative Catholic commentators and from Calvinist commentators, there is a drift here in the direction of using the biblical story not to teach the moral, but rather as an opportunity to paint nude bodies. Uh, this hits its absolute apogee uh, in a certain um, painter, uh, really the crown prince of painters of the Counter-Reformation, uh, Peter Paul Rubens. And this is his uh, very famous Bathsheba at the Fountain, 1635. Um, you know, if you look at this painting, you'll, you should see some things that are quite obviously providing an interpretation. Uh, the items of Bathsheba's toilet are unambiguously arranged in such a way as to invite the viewer of the art to experience vicariously the temptation to which King David has succumbed. We see he doesn't actually. Uh, and and um, it's, um, it's the case that because we see what the artist sees, we are not looking directly at an interpretation. Rubens Bathsheba was painted almost simultaneously with his flamboyantly lascivious Susanna and the Elders. He, by the way, he made enormous amounts of money. He was very, very successful, the wealthiest uh, painter of his time, and he made most of it painting things like this. This is the apocryphal story of Susanna and the Elders. They're all about voyeurism. They're all about using a story which is designed in the text itself uh, to inculcate a kind of warning about abuse and to invite the abuse. It has been thought that both these paintings uh, were, uh, these, these ones that I showed you of, um, of Rubens were inspired by his infatuation with his new wife. He was 53, she was 16. She was his model. Um, and, and you can look at those paintings for a long time and you will not find uh, an iconography that uh, suggests that there's a typology or moral instruction in them. Rubens' father had been a persecuted Calvinist, and after his father's death, he had been raised in Catholic piety of serious intensity by his mother. This painting is, in effect, however, a secular work of art. Now, one may say, that is, this painting is a secular work of art. One may say in the evidence, in fact, that though he was a leading figure amongst the Counter-Reformation painters, his popularity with wealthy patrons, including churchmen, was just for these kinds of voluptuous depictions. So, um, maybe I better go back. Just forgive me for this, I don't like to show uh, this overly, but I just wanna make a couple of comments on this painting. Here's, here's Bathsheba seating, provocatively semi-draped. After her bath, she's having her hair combed by her young maid servant. Her aspect is coquettish, it's casual. Looped loosely around her left arm where it rests against the fountain is an unclasped string of pearls. That's an iconographic sign. It suggests her availability. That's why they're unclasped. A black servant boy presents her with a note from the king, who, like the lecherous elders in many a Susanna painting, leers down from the middle distance of his palace balcony. Bathsheba herself is presented as nubile, but very young. She has an enticed, more than enticing smile for the messenger. Oblivious to the agitated barking of her appropriately protective spaniel, she seems far more alert in every sense to a new opportunity. Rubin paints her quite precisely as though she'd been expecting this message all along. This is a reading of the biblical narrative in which Bathsheba is at the very least complicitous in the affair. Rubin's painting quite deliberately also occasions a certain complicity in the viewer. Now this poor fellow, uh, Rembrandt, um, could not compete financially at all with Rubens. Um, and, and, and partly it was just plain scruple. Some things he would do, some things he wouldn't do. But he was given a commission to paint this particular subject once in 1643. And the way he did it, of course, is to paint it, as you can see, kind of sfumato, kind of blurry. Uh, he's taking uh, the focus, in a sense, away from where it, it, it would have been in Rubens. Um, and then he let it go. And we'll look at some of his paintings, perhaps in the Q&A, Q uh, which are uh, quite interesting as a part of an insight into what Rembrandt is really trying to do. 
But in 1654, um, he had another opportunity to do this. And, um, and, and this is a striking painting. Um, it is anything but like Rubens. Uh, and what he has done here is to eliminate many things in the painting. You can see that it's, uh, it's done with a, a kind of chiaroscuro, a dark background. Uh, he's got the dog gone. He's got the attendants gone. All that's left is you can see part of one of the women who's attending her, and she's an old maid servant. Um, her hair has already been coiffed for the assignation, only the pedicure, dimly recollecting the iconographic washing of the feet, remains to be completed. All sense of adventure has disappeared in this painting. Weighed down in somber reflection, her flesh textured and toned so as to suggest premature aging, this Bathsheba is torn, torn in anguish, between fidelity to her husband and what she must have seen as inescapable acquiescence to the king's imperious lust. There is in Rembrandt's more attuned psychological perspective no need for an unclassed spring of, string of pearls or, or the ineffectually barking dog. Moreover, though as in many earlier treatments, Bathsheba is presented almost frontally and completely nude, no comparable voyeurism is invited. Indeed, unlike Rubens' version, this painting has an almost counter-erotic force amply warranting people who've made the judgment that there's nothing here that Rembrandt's doing that, resp that, that responds to the viewer's need to be titillated. Rembrandt's chiaroscuro, like his dramatic exclusion from the scene of all elements except her own personal crisis, her weighty sadness, underscores the ethical dimension of the biblical narrative, not from David's or the voyeur's point of view, but from Bathsheba's point of view. He thus both reinterprets and repositions the story itself in the biblical reader's mind. Rembrandt's masterpiece is one, is that of one who reads the biblical story with an eye, with an eye for the personal, the personal life of the piece of people that appear in biblical narratives. He's not looking here for catechesis. He's not thinking about doctrines of justification. He's not thinking about exculpation or even of David's eventual repentance and the history of human salvation. He's rather exhibiting compassionate identification with a victim, her sad betrayal by a tyranny of lust and power. We see this deliberate inculpation plainly also in his painting of David and Uriah. By the way, one thing to notice about this Bathsheba, you see the letter in her hand? You see that it's crumpled. She has read this many times. Here's another thing that Rembrandt did. It's this painting of David and Uriah. And you can see in this painting that, that Uriah is being sent out. You can see the two faces. You study the two faces. And you can see that Uriah knows. Um, it's very, very much the same kind of spirit of interpretation that we have in the painting of Bathsheba. Rembrandt is interested in the people who are victimized along the way as much as he is interested in the ostensible heroes of the story. Those two paintings, I suggest, you, you really need to keep in mind and to look at together. What shall we say then for Rembrandt as an interpreter of scripture? Well, this, that he's primarily concerned with the text of the Bible rather than with the catechetical interpretations of any one religious tradition. He's interested in what it must have been like to be one of the people uh, in the narrative, uh, in, reads, as it were, into them uh, the personal element that allows them to be understood as persons, persons who have meaning, persons who are in relationship and he asks the questions that are hard questions. And in these questions that he asks with his painting, there's no kind of triumphalism at all. There's rather something else. And that's a desire to paint truth, human truth, and biblical truth. Thanks very much. And so my first one is this. Out of the painters you've studied, who is your favorite biblical painter, and why? Period. <laughs>
Well, uh, that's really hard because there are several that really come to mind. I think Giotto, with his frescoes, he's the first person to introduce emotion, the emotion of individual people in the biblical narrative. He paints biblical stories in serial succession so that you follow Jesus through his ministry and you look at the reaction of the crowd, you look at the reaction of the uh, elders in the temple. Uh, and so what he's really wanting you to do is to make an emotional identification with Jesus in the situation in which we find him. I think that guy would have to go very near the top of the list. Rembrandt is another for me who manages to do this. I've tried to make a case for that in part and, and, and can maybe do some more on that. Then in the modern period, uh, there are painters who actually have the audacity or the courage to, to look at traditional ways of reading scripture and, and to see what in them seems to be attractive and what in them seems to be misleading and to try to correct the misleading. And that would include Marc Chagall, Georges Rouault, and, uh, and Jean-Marie Pirot or Arcabas, uh, the still living French uh, Catholic painter. Next question. Do you collect art? I do. And uh, tell us what you collect. Well, um, he, sometimes you collect things because it's serendipity. So I have a Guido Reni hanging in our dining room, uh, which is the uh, one of where, where Phoebus is riding across the, um, uh, the sky with uh, the hours surrounding him, chasing Aurora. That's a complete accident. It was an oil sketch for the original ceiling in the Palazzo Rospigliosi. But I also like to create, uh, to, to, to uh, collect drawings, lithographs, and so on of saints, the apostles, uh, and images of the Lord. And um, I have s several of those from different periods. Uh, some of the viewer questions. Uh, have you written or spoken about or studied the prodigal son paintings by Rembrandt? And what are your thoughts? I think after Henri uh, Nouwen has done what he did, uh, that's a wonderful close examination of that painting and he studied it for a long time and I think he read it right. I don't think there's anything that I could do to really add much to what Henri Nouwen did with that painting, but that's a remarkable book and I recommend it to everyone. Dr. Jeffries, please address your view on the loss of much art within the post-Reformation Protestant, especially Puritan evangelical churches. Well, this is, a, this is a bit of a painful subject. I, I grew up in an evangelical home. I grew up in a, in a Scottish Baptist church in Canada. And um, but my fa I, we were in that church because my father became a convert when he was a teenager. And uh, when he, uh, he was a painter. Uh, and when he joined the church, the minister immediately told me to have to stop painting because he was breaking the second commandment. And he did. And he lived a long life, I think, of deep, deep regret, uh, and some of the rest of us had deep regret with them. So I thought a lot about this question. What is it in our tradition that makes us leery of art? Why is it that, that, that we jump back, those of us who are, uh, some of us at least, who are from this tradition, uh, from what art can do? And I think there are two things that strike me as, as pertinent. One is the idea that nobody can know what Jesus looked like, so it would be kind of, a, a kind of an act of blasphemy to represent him, right? And the other is that uh, art can mislead as well as lead. And I've just shown you some examples of why that is in part justified, that particular view. Um, what I came to understand is, is that because of the incarnation, it's possible because God became man and dwelt human flesh, it's possible for us to think about representing the Lord. I also, I'm a bit of an Old Testament scholar, so uh, you know what I saw uh, about God in the Old Testament was enormously encouraging to me. God seems to like beauty. He, he seems to have been an artist. Um, he seems to have regarded his creation as a wonderful work of art. And when he wanted to meet with people, as in the book of Exodus, chapter 25 to 31, uh, he, he wants a tabernacle. He wants a mishkan built uh, for himself. And uh, he, he, he doesn't want just anybody to do it. It's sort of like Mark Lanier here, you know? He doesn't paint the ceilings himself. Uh, he finds somebody to paint the ceilings for him. And so Moses uh, is told by the Lord, you're not up to this, Moses. Maybe a great administrator and leader, uh, but there's this fellow named Bezalel and his buddy Aholiab and a bunch of women who are very wise-hearted, and I think you better get them to do what I'm telling you to do, and then God lays down the plan, right? And the tabernacle is made to be beautiful. Uh, the Lord loves beauty. And here's another thing to think about. No time for tonight. I'm doing a commentary on Isaiah right now. And one of the things that will strike you about Isaiah, if you read it in the Hebrew, is this is the most beautiful poetry in all of Scripture, including the Psalms, and it's put in the mouth of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, and out comes his 
gorgeous poetry. In, in, in scripture, God is a poet even when he's ticked off, like in chapter 38 of the book of Job, <laughs> right? Uh, so what do we learn about the Lord? It's important to understand, I think, in scripture, not only what God says to us, but the manner in which he speaks to us. That'll be true for Jesus in the New Testament too. Yeah, well said, well said, well said. So in that regard, uh, uh, one of the people that you used to study with, uh, teach with, argue with, uh, Hans Ruckmacher, uh, who was one of the artist uh, interpreters and art teachers that influenced Francis Schaeffer. Um, I, I remember reading Schaeffer saying uh, that, that uh, w within the framework of art itself, we find the best teaching and the best understanding of the age of the, the writers. And I, I wonder within your framework, if you're able to find not, not only an understanding of these biblical paintings, but how do they express the theology and the thought of their day or the potential direction after their day? So much uh, to say there. Um, I spent a great deal of time thinking about this, but let's just start with the early church. The early church, so the downstairs Roman church, uh, making paintings in the catacombs, uh, making uh, coffins, sarcophagi, to bury uh, people in. Uh, the paintings and the carvings <clears throat> are all to do with Old Testament subjects, and the Old Testament subjects all have to do with the extension and the promise of the, uh, of, of the word of the Lord going to the Gentiles and the conversion of the Gentiles. It's a dominant theme, so you can just, if any of you are interested in that, send me an email and I'll send you something on this. Uh, what you see there <clears throat> is in the early church, they are very much, they're the newbies, right? Uh, there the, the are the Jewish people who convert around them and become followers of Jesus, and in a sense, they're right within their tradition. But if you're a Roman, or if you're a Corinthian, or if you're from Ephesus, you're not. So what you notice in Scripture is that this, from the promise of Abraham in Genesis 12, verse 1, right down through the story of Jonah, which is one of the big stories. Jonah doesn't want the, the Ninevites to convert, right? <laughs> but God does, right? And that's a repeated theme, and they love it. So... But for every period, there's something which emerges is important. <clears throat> One of the things that really emerges that's in tremendous importance in the a period roughly from 1400 to 1700 is the Annunciation. It becomes the most commonly painted altarpiece subject. The angel Gabriel comes and finds Mary, uh, and he gives her the word. And these are on altarpieces because it's a proclamation of the word that is going to be then give, reflected in the proclamation of the word to the people, right? And when the angel comes and finds Mary, she's on her knees reading the Bible. And in some of these paintings, she's not just reading the Bible, but she's even holding the Bible in a kind of cloth, tenderly like this. And the name of that cloth in Latin is incunabula, swaddling clothes. Because she has been attentive to the word of the Lord, she becomes a fit vessel to receive the word which will become flesh in Jesus. That's a big theme in that period. But for every period, there's, there are themes like that. Here's a simple one. Was Bathsheba complicit? <laughs> I incline to Rembrandt's view, as you might expect, uh, not to Rubens. Uh, I think that one of the things about the Bathsheba narrative that you might notice is that she doesn't get to say much. In fact, all the verbs in that passage have to do with David's action. David rose, David calls, David orders, right? And all you get from Bathsheba is after she finds out, she sends over a message, I'm pregnant. Well, I don't know, I rest my case. <laughs> in Rembrandt's first Bathsheba painting, the dog seems to be replaced by a peacock. Is that right? And what does it represent? It's very confusing uh, because the peacock traditionally represents something like eternal life. Uh, and so if you find it in, in, in catacomb paintings or if you find it in early Christian art, it, it's, it's something which is actually born from the pagan world. Uh, and it does signify a kind of the beauty of paradise, the beauty uh, which is celestial. I think Rembrandt in that painting might have been suggesting to, 
about her that her beauty is not the beauty that you look at when you see her without her clothes on. Please clarify the symbol of washing feet and would it have any application to Mary washing Jesus' feet in paintings at the time? Uh, the washing of feet thing is, um, is, is a very mixed story. But washing of feet, of course, is a necessary ritual in that culture because when you came in from the outside, because you've been walking uh, through dusty streets, it, your feet are dirty. And so it's, a, it's an act of hospitality to, to, to give people water to wash their feet or better yet, to have somebody wash their feet for them. It's, an, it's just an, a generous act. Um, the way it's used in these paintings that I just talked about is playing on a, uh, on a word play. In, in Hebrew, regal means feet, but regal also means genitalia. So, so uh, you, you, if you look at some passages, you'll see that, that there obviously is a double entendre. There, there are both things going on here. That's, in a sense, aside from the tradition, which is a tradition of hospitality. Uh, a tradition of being generous, uh, a tradition of self-effacement before the, the guest. So it's an extreme act of hospitality and self-offering for the other. Okay, you teach a lot of students, you teach a lot of this material, and you may have already shared it with us, but several would like to know um, what in the process of teaching students about art and theology and history what do you find resonates most clearly in the minds of students? An aha moment or a wow or something like that? One of the things I think for students in our culture who are not sufficiently exposed to art, most of them, is to discover that the artist will see a biblical story with which they may be very familiar and he will see in it a beauty that is entirely missing in the sermon they heard on Sunday. Uh, he will see that the beauty is, uh, is there in the, just the nature of the persons that are represented, the way in which the act, action is framed. And, he, and the student, or, or, uh, male or female, is drawn into this notion that the Bible contains beauty. It's about beauty. And it is entirely consistent with the character of God, who is beauty. The psalmist says, this is one of the verses which the kids always in my classes remember, Psalm 27. Uh, Psalm 27, it's verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I may dwell forever in the house of the Lord. There to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord forever. <laughs> well, that's, that gives it to you. <laughs> uh, in that regard, uh, final question. Uh, the um, folks like Rukmacher, folks like Schaefer, and others are big on the idea that when humanity was made in the image of God, humanity in a sense becomes creative like creator god but on a minor scale so god calls day and night and 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 names everything up until he's made adam and then adam takes over the job and adam gets to name the animals and adam's got the creativity um do you see artistic expression as a reflection of humans uh, uh, bearing this image of God? And if so, would you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, I'm, absolutely I do, and I would hardly be novel in so doing, uh, for it's there uh, from the earliest fathers of the church on. In what sense can we say we are made in the image of God? Well, we don't look like him physically. He doesn't look like us physically. Uh, do we say that we're made in the image of God in the sense that we have anything approaching his powers? No, of course we don't. But there's one respect in which we are like unto him and which is encouraged in our reading of scripture. We have an imagination. And, and our imagination is this, Augustine says, of the image of God, the imago dei in us. And I think that's the right insight and it's repeated right down through Christian tradition and I think you'll find that in, uh, in Protestant tradition uh, amongst uh, some people as well as in the dominantly Catholic tradition. Would you all join me in thanking Dr. Jeffries for coming in?